Bay Area Discs 2015 Youth Ultimate Coaching Conference. And, and I do think that Mike can confirm that I have played and I am undefeated. <laughs> Just for the record. Mike, can you confirm that? <laughs> so thank you very much for, uh, for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to be in the role that I am with uh, USA Ultimate. And thanks to Valerio for putting on a really cool conference that we hope these will happen all over the US. Uh, but this is a great example of uh, doing a great job and doing really cool stuff here. So thank you very much, and thanks for having me. I need to tell you right up front and apologize for this. I am a rare case in the United States right now of recovering. I am in the middle of recovering from a very severe case of whooping cough disease. And it is brutal, let me tell you. I got knocked off my feet, was in the hospital for five days. Um, team of physicians could not figure out what was wrong with me. Uh, a couple of near death. Uh, experiences with being unable to breathe for long periods of time, passing out, wake up surrounded by people getting ready to intubate me, and so don't get whooping cough disease. But for today, what happens is I lose my voice, and I am really hoping that I can get through this without, I also go into coughing fits, which are completely uncontrollable. And so bear with me if that happens, because I will just get down behind the podium, and I mean this very sincerely, if it happens, there's nothing I can do about it. And they are gross, and I will do my very best to manage it and get back up and continue. But if it happens, it happens. And Stephen watched me get through a board meeting with this, so hopefully we can get through today without you guys having to witness an episode of whooping cough disease right in front of you. So um, after listening to the, present, the first presentations this morning, I've completely changed what I want to talk about. <laughs> and I thought that I would just come up and say, Diana's presentation, right on. Danny's presentation, right on. Any questions? Because <laughs> what a setup for really, really cool stuff. And so let me try to establish a little credibility beyond being super lucky to be in the role that I am uh, with all of you. Um, I did spend uh, a decade at the U.S. Olympic Committee working on, believe it or not, long-term athlete development 15 years ago. And we spent many, many hours and years working on this with all of the national governing bodies. And here we are back talking about it again in many of the same ways. So what I want to try to do today is first talk about some really big picture stuff. And by the way, if we have time, there are some super exciting developments going on for Ultimate in the United States and in the world right now that have just happened in the last couple of weeks that if we have time to talk about them, I'm happy to share those. That would be, and I'll try to tie it in if I can, but really exciting developments. Um, the, the thing I'm going to try to do today that I had talked to Valerio about is I am lucky to serve on a committee, a council, at the United States Olympic Committee right now that is leading long-term athlete development. We call it the American Development Model in the United States. Um, and we have been studying this for many years. And um, we are about to have a major push in the US for this concept of long-term athlete development where we finally actually do it instead of just talking about it. And it's being led by the United States Olympic Committee, the NCAA, as well as companies like Nike and others that are pouring some money into it. So there's a real chance that it's going to take hold. There's a huge conference in Washington coming up that is actually being driven by the Aspen Institute, if you've ever followed some of their research. It's a really cool organization that does sort of cutting edge research on things. And they're looking at sports, in particular youth sports right now. And the cool thing for Ultimate in the United States is we're completely plugged into this. And in many ways, because of the fortunate relationships that I have with the Olympic Committee, we're kind of going to be able to lead it. So what's happening is Ultimate is starting to get used as an example for other sports to learn from. 
as opposed to being sort of a stepchild that people are like, yeah, that's fun and whatever. And our whole image is changing in, in really cool ways. So one of the, to, to establish a little credibility in terms of my passion for this, I wanted to describe that in addition to the work that I did at the Olympic Committee, I've also had the great privilege and fortune and luck in my career to work with NFL franchises, NBA franchises, NHL franchises, top 10 professional tennis players in both high performance domains as well as on the business side of both of all of those. Um, and I've learned a ton. Uh, basically my whole career has been learning, learning, learning. And one of the reasons that I'm excited to be in the role I am now is because I honestly believe, like Diana described, that sports, when done right, when done right, can enhance human existence in a very powerful way. When done wrong, it can have the exact opposite effect, particularly on kids. So one of the things that I'm trying to do at USA Ultimate, in addition to take advantage of what I think, honestly, having studied sport as part of my job, having experienced all of those experiences that I've just described, I really, truly believe that Ultimate is the coolest sport on the planet for a bunch of different reasons. But this, what I discovered when I discovered Ultimate, thanks to a niece of mine, is that baked into Ultimate is everything that makes sports good so that the outcomes that we can get out of kids and everybody playing the sport are baked in in a way that's a huge advantage over all the other sports. And guess what? The rest of the sports world is catching on. So at the IOC level, the USOC level, and the NGB level, Ultimate is being discovered as a sport that other sports can learn from. And so part of what I want to do at the, just at the beginning today, because I've learned that because of the way Ultimate has evolved as a sport, a lot of people involved, like all of you, that are really the people that are going to drive the sport forward, right, because of the work that you do. I want to make sure that everybody sort of understands how we fit in and how sport is organized in the world in the United States so that we can fit in and do it the right way, so that we actually maximize our potential. And that's part of my goal today is to describe this. And this is a bit of, again, a bit of an evolution for us just in the last couple of years. So sport in the world is organized in a very structured way. And in Danny's presentation, you notice that the two videos that he put up demonstrating the commitment to athlete development were the United States Tennis Association and USA Hockey, right? Which I thought it was great that Danny chose a couple of US NGBs as the example. I was very excited to see that fact. You know, the one other thing I did pick up that Danny said was that because of the competition structure being too busy, the Canadians don't want to play in the series anymore. That was an interesting thing. I don't know if anybody else picked that up, but I'm going to take that back and make sure everybody did. Did, <laughs> did nobody else hear Danny say that? I'm pretty sure I heard him say that. But so let's talk just a little bit about the structure of sport in the world, where we fit in, and then I'm going to try to come back to this if we have time and talk about how right now USA Ultimate has a huge new initiative underway that's very important for organizations like Bay Area DISC and many others to understand so hopefully you can plug in to this and take advantage of this going forward. But I think this is really important from an athlete development perspective as well, just so you understand sort of our responsibility now as the national governing body recognized by the United States Olympic Committee, the expectations on us and how we do our work and what work we do is really different than it would have been five years ago. Really different. We just had two senior level people come to our, our most recent board meeting and kind of teach us. Here's what we expect you to be doing. And by the way, here's how we're going to focus on your work and make sure you're doing it. And they basically said the spotlight is now on you because now that you're in the family, there are some expectations you have to meet. So. For those of you that are not aware of how sort of sport is organized, the top is the International Olympic Committee. 
it's the most powerful organization in sports in the world. Because all sports, for, except for American football, uh, which is trying to get in, and can't, by the way. They are trying to get into the Olympic family right now, and they can't. Uh, and, but they may, eventually. They're, they're making a bunch of adjustments to get in. But the IOC really is the organization responsible for sport in the world. And then the way they work is they work through two groups. National Olympic Committee, so for us that's the USOC, as well as international federations, and for us that's WIFTF. And so they work through these two bodies, and then those bodies work through national governing bodies like USA Ultimate, Ultimate Canada, the United States Tennis Association, USA Hockey, et cetera, for the sports, right? That's the way international sport is organized. And, and then what USA Ultimate is trying to do is work through affiliates and chapters around the country to deliver our programs and do many of the things that we're going to talk about when it comes to athlete development because USA Ultimate can't do athlete development, right? We can't do that. What we can do is, is try to facilitate and empower organizations like Bay Area DISC to do athlete development and all of the other groups around the United States. But what we've got to do is work together to achieve the things that Danny talked about and the things that we're going to be doing in the United States. And I'll show you what this is going to look like from a, a big picture perspective. And this is going to be driven by the United States Olympic Committee. So here's the one other point that I wanted to make that a lot of people don't realize about the US Olympic Committee. Many people, when they think of the USOC, they think of our Olympic teams, right? How are we going to do in Rio? We're going to do really well, by the way, in Rio. Um, how are we going to do with the next Winter Games? And that's what they're focused on, and they are. They are laser focused on that through the national governing bodies because the USOC does not develop a single athlete. It's done through the NGBs. But the USOC has a lot to say about how that work gets done because in the United States, as, as you, you may or may not have thought about, we don't have a ministry of sport. We don't have Sport Canada or the coaching association, as Danny described it. In many of the countries that we compete against, they have a ministry of education, a ministry of commerce, a ministry, and a ministry of sport. We do too in the United States. It's the United States Olympic Committee, which is very different from other countries. So about I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, Congress made the decision that the Ministry of Sport in the United States was going to be the United States Olympic Committee. So in addition to actually fielding Olympic teams and trying to go do really well at Olympic Games, they are also, so in the United States Olympic Committee is the NCAA, the National High School Federations, Jewish Community Centers, YMCAs, boys and girls clubs, all of those organizations fall under the umbrella of the United States Olympic Committee. And I, a lot of people don't realize that. So getting into this Olympic family is a huge thing for USA Ultimate because we're now in that family. And I'll give you a couple of examples and Mike can describe this in his session later, which I encourage you to go to. Um, since our very first Olympic assembly, where we kind of showed off Ultimate for the first time. And we had a chance to do that in multiple different settings. And we were like, here's Ultimate. A lot of you don't know about this sport. And here's the thing that's really important for those of you that are in Ultimate all day, every day, to realize that in all of those settings, when I do those presentations, at least 50% of the people in the room have no idea what I'm talking about. They do not know what Ultimate is. They are clueless. They're like, you can watch them. They're like, did you know about this? Did you know? That? They don't know. So while, while we do this all day, every day, and we think that everybody knows about it, in the world of sport, we are still an undiscovered sport in many ways. And when people see it, they get it. They're like, wow, that is really cool. And then when they learn about the spirit of the game and the other elements that we have baked into the sport, 
groups like the JCCs and the CYOs and the Boys and Girls Club, we used to be, would you please, how about offering some ultimate? Would you consider offering ultimate? What do you, you know, we got this cool sport, what do you think? No, you know, I've heard about ultimate. And you know the image the sport has had in the past. That has changed drastically now. And Mike is fielding phone calls from the JCCs and the CYOs and the Boys and Girls Club saying, spirit of the game, conflict resolution, really inexpensive. Holy cow, this is fun, most of all. Not just fun, but wicked fun. Right? And that's, we're getting everybody to understand that it's not just fun, it's wicked fun. And they are calling us now. We don't have to call on them anymore. They're calling us saying, we want to make sure this is on our menu. How do we do it? Why is that so cool? One, it's immediate credibility for the sport of ultimate to be in this Olympic family. We are now going to have youth serving organizations that do this really well. This is what they do, right? They are putting ultimate on the menu. They're going to introduce it for us. We've never had that before. That's millions and millions of dollars that are, that's going to get poured into our sport without costing us a dime. And guess where those kids are going to come after they have that experience? Bay Area Disc. Because what those groups ask us is, what do we do with the kids after we introduce them to the sport? Because that's all they want to do. They want to put it on the menu. And then they want to say, here's where you go. We are about to have an influx of thousands and thousands of kids that you know once they learn how to play, they're going to they're gonna want to play, right? Because they're going to have a blast. And with all of the other elements that we have fully baked into the sport, that you have baked into the sport over the years, parents are going to love it. They're not going to get concussions. They're going to learn about conflict resolution. I don't have a referee to yell at so that I don't embarrass my kids. So the, I'll get into a little bit more in terms of where we are in the United States in just a sec. But I wanted to make the point that hang on. We're going to hang on. We are going to hang on to that which makes this sport special because that's what's turning people on. It's what's turning people on is that we're different and better than the other sports, not that we're trying to be the same as other sports. And the things that they love are the spirit of the game. And believe me, self-officiation is really intriguing to the IOC, to the USOC, and ESPN. The reason ESPN has the observers mic'd up is not because they want to listen to the observers. It's because they're trying to figure out how to get that discussion between the athletes clearly on the air in a way where it becomes a unique element and makes the sport totally different from other sports. So when, when you hear us continue to push the spirit of the game and the observer model and many of the other things that make us different, there's, there's two reasons for it. One, we truly believe that it's unique, special, and powerful, and that it, because of that approach to the sport does many of the things that Diana talked about earlier baked right into the sport without a lot of effort. The other reason is purely selfish, commercial, and economic. Our best path to the future is going to be because we're different and better, not because we're the same. And that is why you're going to see USA Ultimate hang on to that and drive for that, because that's going to give us the best opportunity to expose this cool sport to as many kids and people as we possibly can. So with all of that, let me go on to um, and I think this did freeze up. I want to talk about what's going on in the United States from an athlete development perspective and then circle back to sort of how that can work at the local level. Let's, let's skip that one and come back to that. So in the United States, as I described, we're calling it the American development model. And this is kind of where we are and where we're going with this. Okay. So as, as uh, Danny described, this is the Canadian model. And I joke around with Danny all the time. We're doing here in the US and at USA Ultimate what we always do, 
which is we just wait for Canada to do a bunch of really good work, <laughs> and we steal it. And luckily, with Danny, we have a phenomenal partner, but they have already done a lot of really good work. So we're going to school on what Canada does, and we do this all the time. And luckily, they're very friendly and cooperative, and they let us steal stuff. So we could go on to the next. If you think about this model, and think about how this translates into the United States, and think about grade levels and club levels, this is the way at the Olympic Committee with all the NGBs we're working with, this is the way we kind of think about the athlete development model in the United States. And you'll notice that, much like what Danny talked about, we're trying to figure out some guidance to give parents because ultimately they decide what experiences their kids have. So right now where we're at is saying, when you're learning to train, maybe three sports would be good, but not one sport, right? No sport specialization. The more, the better. Prior to that, it's all about developing fundamental movement skills and motor skills because we know that sports are really applications of fundamental movement skills. Running, leaping, catching, and throwing are fundamental skills we learn as kids. We learn how to run, we learn how to leap, we learn how to catch, we learn how to throw, hopefully, if we're in an active lifestyle. All sports skills are, are applications of combinations of fundamental movement. So forget ultimate for a second. Let's take baseball, great American sport. Trying to get back in the Olympic Games. They're going to be competing with us. So baseball, let's say fielding a ground ball in baseball, if you're a kid and you're learning how to field a ground ball in baseball, what is it? It's a little reaction time at the crack of the bat, and then it's running, shuffling, skipping, trapping, and throwing. That's what fielding a ground ball is. It's an application of combinations of fundamental movement. That's what ultimate is, right? So if we, as a, as a country, can get all of our kids to develop those fundamental movements as they're going through those, those training periods that Danny outlined, think about what our athletes are going to look like 15 years from now. Picture the, the ultimate athlete in 15 years if at age 8 to 12 they're learning all of the disc handling skills that truthfully right now for most kids in the United States is not happening until after that. Right? We're still not down there. We've got to keep pushing down to get to that 8 to 12 age group where they're playing a bunch of different sports and they can do all of those movements but they're also developing disc handling skills. And just imagine what that's going to look like in 15 years if we can do that. Our athletes are going to be smoking good and really fun to watch. They'll be amazing, even more than they are today, which is already the case. Uh, next. So some things in the US that are a little bit different from other countries. So we can't just steal from Canada. We've got to do our own research and figure out how this works for us. One of our challenges in the United States is that, and, and Danny talked about this a little bit as well, we have parents, and Diana did, we have parents that think, wow, I'll invest 25,000 bucks a year because I want my uh, daughter to play in the WNBA or on a professional soccer team or to make an Olympic team. Mostly what they think about is they want to get an NCAA scholarship, right? And so there is, it's going to be very difficult, and it has been very difficult for us to get families and parents to cooperate with us in this model that we're about to start pushing out to the population. There'll be marketing campaigns around this. There'll be educational campaigns like the one you see coming out of tennis and out of hockey, and it's going to come out for all sports, that this is what you should be doing for your kids. But there's a lot of inertia against it because parents are thinking, not if they're going to get that scholarship. I've got to get them specialized or they're not going to be one of the best. And we're going to have to collectively, in Ultimate and other sports, we're going to have to push back against that because we know from science that it's just not true. Same thing, NFL, MLB, NBA, that's what kids and families are constantly exposed to in the United States through 
multiple channels now. And if, if all they think about is that, it's very hard to get parents to realize that going out and playing just for fun is as valuable as being in a very specific sport specialized kind of setting. So we've got to overcome that. Next, please. So I just want to start with this is the statement at the top. United States Olympic Committee and its national governing bodies embrace athlete development principles that allow American youth to utilize sport as a path toward an active and healthy lifestyle and create opportunities for athletes to maximize their full potential. That may not mean getting a scholarship. That may not mean making a team that becomes a world champion. That may not mean some of the things that parents dream about. We want them to just want their kids to maximize their potential and to have a whole lot of fun along the way. So that is the beginning statement. And let's skip these other ones because I'm going to come back to them, please. So if we can go to the next one. So here's what we're uh, mimicking, if you will, from other countries. But this is going to be the US uh, five stages. And it's going to be stage one, which is discover, learn, play. Right? Just discover, learn, and play. Stage two, develop and challenge. Stage three, train and compete. Stage four, we divide it out into two separate ones because this is where we see a tremendous amount of attrition in sports in the United States is right at this 13, 14, 15 year old age group. Right now you can watch sport participation go like this and then go boom, right into a ditch. And the reason is we have not done a very good job with this one, participate and succeed. Not necessarily excel for high performance. And that's where we got to get parents comfortable with this is still an incredibly cool part of life. There's still a lot of things you can learn by participating. You don't have to be trying to excel. And if we can get parents to understand that, um, we're not, we'll see that drop off start to fade. It's also incumbent on us to make sure we create playing opportunities for both sets of kids, right? Kids that are like, I really want to try to excel, and kids that say, I'm just having a blast. I just want to keep playing. We have not done a good job with that in the United States. Part of that is also our school-based system, where it's you want to get on the varsity. There's only 15 kids on the roster. Everybody else is done. That's where we see the drop-off. Cool opportunity for us if ultimate is sitting there at that age and stage, just like it is right now where we're like, okay, you don't want to play soccer anymore? You didn't make the team? You're on the basketball team, you got cut, come play ultimate. We can keep doing that. I hope that we do even more at younger ages. And then um, Excel for High Performance goes all the way up to the top, but then also Thrive and Mentor for Life. So I am, when I get a chance to get in a room like this with people like you, that are doing what you do every day for the sport and for kids and organizing and coaching, etc. That's kind of the stage you're at that we desperately need. For the sport to thrive, we need coaches and mentors that are going to help kids learn how to play and love the sport. And that's the incredibly cool work that you're doing. So please keep doing it and get your friends to do it too. And let's get more and more people after they get finished playing club to actually sit in this room all over the United States doing the same stuff because that is how we can truly scale and grow the sport. Without it, we can't, and I'll come back to that if I have time. Next, please. Here, for, for whatever it's worth, is, and this is, this is evolving, so we're still working on this. In the US, these are going to be the key principles that are going to drive the athlete development or the American development model. First is universal access. We want every kid in the United States to have an opportunity to play sports. And again, it's great to follow great speakers like we've had. Just like Diana talked about, if you truly believe that, like I do, sports can enhance human existence, we should make sure that every kid gets a chance to play. So one of the cool things going on right now at USA Ultimate is we just created the USA Ultimate Foundation. The sole purpose of the foundation is going to be to try to raise money to give monies back to our affiliates and our chapters and our local groups so that every kid has an opportunity to play. One of the coolest programs we have underway right now is this one, GUM. 
where we try to get girls all over the United States exposed to the sport, playing the sport, loving the sport, and we end up with 70% of our population being girls and 30% of our population being boys. How cool would that be? Given what we know about this sport and what it does in terms of empowerment and, and what we know about what sports in general does for girls and women and how it contributes to the quality of their life and the experience that they have, I mean, how cool and powerful is that if we can make that happen? We want to make that happen. We want to make that happen. And we think we can because there's elements of ultimate that are incredibly appealing to girls, right? There's social elements, there's fun elements, there's um, the spirit of the game elements, there's the acceptance element that is not the cutthroat elements that you find in other sports that it's going to be incredibly appealing. And wouldn't it be cool if instead of, right now we're 70, 30 men to women or boys to girls, how cool would it be if we could get that reversed and get a bunch more girls playing? I personally think it would be one of the coolest things that we could do. And we're trying to do it by making sure that every girl has access to sports regardless of their circumstances and, and every boy too. Next, developmentally appropriate activities that emphasize motor foundational skill development. This is where we got to teach parents and teach teachers in schools how to create opportunities for movement, free play, etc. so everybody can run, jump, skip, trap, and throw and then they can apply that to whatever sport is most appealing to them or hopefully multiple sports. Next one is really big, multi-sport. And it, what do you think the biggest inertia against this multi-sport? I mean, it makes sense, right? If you think about it, depending on how you grew up, if you're like me, you played like a bunch of different sports, right? That's what we did every day is after school, we went and played sports, depending on the season, whatever, lots of people do it. Why are we having, what do you think is the biggest impediment to us achieving uh, principle number three in the United States? Anybody? Sports on TV. So you see the NFL player and you think, I want to be that guy, so I'm going to play NFL or I'm going to play football all the time. That's for sure part of it. Yeah. There's a lot of less big organized sports, like in the neighborhood, you know, just going down to the park and playing on their own. It's all you know, parents driving kids to a place, and there's a league, and there's a, so it's less kid oriented, so it's organized. So, as, as Diana described it in the way I grew up, one of the things we did all the time was we would go to the playground, right? We would go to the playground in our neighborhood, and we would play pickup hoops. And you wanted to, you wanted to keep winning, by the way because then you kept the court, right? So who you put on your team, did anybody else grow up this way? Like, you know, it, winning didn't matter except, yeah, it did. Because <laughs> if you got the right people on the team with you, then you kept the court, which meant you get to kept, keep playing. So winning did matter, and who you had on your team mattered. But we made up rules like you can't believe in order to make it more fun and more interesting. And because kids that weren't playing would be like, hey, this stinks. I want to play, so we're going to change this rule about who gets to keep the court. And we'd be like, okay, we'll change that, because if that were me, that would stink. I wouldn't want to be standing on the side. Very little of that anymore. Very little. And the other thing is economics. Economics. So here we have tennis as an NGB. By the way, I'll give you an example of our financial goals. Tennis, U.S. tennis is bigger than the United States Olympic Committee. U.S. Tennis is about a 200 to $250 million organization. That's their annual operating budget. Uh, USA Hockey, 35 to $40 million organization, just to use the examples that Danny put up, which is where they get the resources to do cool stuff like that, right? because they've grown into these bodies that have a lot of resources to do a lot of cool stuff. And We've got a long way to go there as ultimate, but we will get there. We want to get there the right way. We want to get there uh, hanging on to all of the cool things about ultimate. But the multi-sport participation is being held back by economics. So tennis, there are a lot of people that make their living in tennis as tennis pros, teaching tennis professionals. They don't want those kids playing soccer. They don't want them playing ultimate. They don't want them playing hockey, despite what that video says. They're like, I can't make a living if that kid isn't committed to my program year round. That's the way I can make my living. Tennis clubs, 
they're not encouraging multi-sport participation because if the kids only show up for one season and then go play another sport, they can't pay their bills. So one of the biggest obstacles, which is an entrepreneurial opportunity, I can't help it. I have been an entrepreneur my whole life, multiple times. This is a huge entrepreneurial opportunity for smart people because as this gets pushed out by, by us and the USOC and educational groups, what an opportunity to create multi-sport recreation centers where kids can come in and play and explore all kinds of different sports that are also economically viable because those kids keep coming back and they're playing team handball and ultimate and hoops and tennis and, and, and. But they keep coming back because the parents see that they're having a safe, fun, high quality experience and those centers become economically viable centers. So we got to think smart as we push this model out in the United States because there's nothing like economic pressure to stop us in our tracks because everybody's got to pay their bills. And the economy drives almost everything at the end of the day. Almost everything comes down to economics. That's a, a truth that I just happen to believe in based on all my years of experiences. Almost everything ultimately comes down to economics. Think about politically in the United States. What are, what's on the minds of people almost all the time, if the economy isn't humming really well, what drives politics and elections is the economy. And that's true all over the world. We've got to be smart about the economy. Next, we want it to be fun, engaging, and challenging atmospheres. Obviously, you always start with fun because we know that's what kids want. But here's, this is something that I'm philosophically a little bit in conflict with some of my colleagues about. I think that this is equally important, challenging. You know what kids don't like is great job, great job, way to work hard, way to give it some effort. That was really nice. Great, great, great. After a while, they're like, I can do almost anything, and you've got to tell me great job. Kids want to be challenged, I believe that human beings, all of us, want to maximize our human potential. I think it's innate. A lot of people disagree with me. I think it's innate as a human that we want to be the best that we can be. We want to grow, we want to learn, we want to achieve, we want to challenge ourselves. I believe kids do too. And so we got to be careful that we don't transfer fun into no matter what you do, it's OK, because kids get tired of that after a while. It's got to be fun and challenging. And I know some of you may disagree with me about that. Um, and then quality coaching, I mean, this is unbelievably important. If you think about it, sports is delivered through coaches. It is the delivery system of sport. And in ultimate, we are catching up, right? We are catching up because for the longest time, ultimate didn't have a lot of coaches at any level, whether it was at the very small youth that we used to have, which was not, you know, Ultimate was college and beyond in many, many ways. We're just now getting down into the young ages, which is why we got to get this just right, by the way. And we have a cool opportunity to get it just right because we've got the blank slate, right? We can not make the mistakes many other sports have made. So let's commit together to do that. But we need more of you that are going to deliver the sport the right way so it can be fun and challenging and really enhance human existence. Next one, please. The key outcomes we're driving for. Now, this first one you may find surprising, um, but there are, there are a couple of elements to this. But one of the key outcomes we want to get is grow both the general athlete population, so a bunch of kids and athletes out there playing, but also grow the pool of potential phenomenal athletes. Because I can tell you at the United States Olympic Committee, they want to go win medals at the Olympic Games. And they want the national governing bodies to go win medals at the Olympic Games. And the national governing bodies want to go win at the Olympic Games. So we want, if you think about, I, I, when I was at the Olympic Committee, I had, this is the coolest job. You can't believe what a cool job. I traveled around the world. This was my job. Travel around the world, learn from the smartest people in sport, steal their best ideas. This is why we follow Canada all the time. 
bring them back to the United States, and implement them in the United States. That was essentially my job description. That's what I got to do for a decade. And one of the things that is cool about sport is that unlike in business, like Google and Apple, imagine if that's how you know, Apple went over to Google and said, hey, can we take a look at what's the latest stuff that you guys are doing to be really good? I don't think they'd get a warm reception. In sport, they're like, yeah, come on. And we did the same thing. We'd be like, we'll show you everything we're doing. So the learning was actually really easy and really cool. But believe me, at the Olympic level, other countries want to beat the US really bad. They, more than anything, they like to beat us. So if we can enlarge the population of potential athletes, then we can continue to be successful um, at, the, at the Olympic level. And that's actually really important. At least it is to the Olympic Committee. Fundamental skills. That transfer between sports, obviously, we've talked a ton about that. Appropriate avenue to fulfill athletic potential. The goal is maximize potential, not necessarily get a scholarship, play in the NFL or the NBA. It's about maximizing human potential for all of the kids. And then this one I, I think is really cool, create a generation that loves sport and physical activity and transfers that passion onto the next generation. One of the reasons, by the way, can you guess why Nike is involved in a big way in this initiative. Anybody want to guess? Well, because the data is showing them that they need to be really scared. So this big drop off is getting worse. So there's a huge, there's a huge section of our population, our young population, meaning kids, that are not playing sports anymore. They've given up on sports. And so, so if I can just talk about this for one second, because this is why why I love Ultimate so much. Why do you think there's this huge drop off in youth participation? Because we now know, we have the data, thanks to the NCAA and Nike and the Aspen Inst Institute, we now know why this is happening. Why do you think it's happening? Well, that's part of it. <laughs> the focus on winning, the lack of fun, the sports specialization, where kids are getting hurt, they're getting burned out, and they're basically saying, this isn't any fun. I'm not having any fun. And here's one of the things they said that I thought was incredibly interesting and really sad, is my coaches are teaching me how to cheat. My coaches are teaching me how to take a dive in front of the official, or to fake this, or how, how to get away with holding. Is that why we want kids getting involved in sport? I mean, that, that's not going to lead to enhanced human existence or many of the things that I know all of us believe in. And the kids are picking up on it. They're like, that, well, why do I want to do that? So they're dropping out at faster rates than they ever have before. Well, who's going to pay attention to that more than Nike? They're, just, they're like, Ugh. we're not going to sell as many sneakers, as much apparel, if all of these kids are dropping out. So they and other sporting good manufacturer groups are also getting behind this movement so that kids stay involved in sport for a longer period of time. And we fix what is a broken system. But here's the interesting thing for Ultimate, is we don't teach kids how to cheat, right? With spirit of the game and the model of our sport, the reason I think the potential of this beautiful, beautiful sport is so huge is we're better than those other sports. Four kids, four families, four parents that are highly discerning about the experience their kids have, they're going to look around and say, yeah, no, I don't like the concussions. I don't want somebody teaching my kid how to cheat. And I got a sport over here that is where you can be quick and athletic and have both aerobic and anaerobic energy systems involved and be incredibly fit and it's wicked fun and there's a community that's accepting and friendly and you learn all these things about life. Whew. Unbelievable potential. But we gotta maintain the stuff that makes us different and better because that's what's gonna draw people to the sport. Because guess what? Lacrosse is also fun. Ice hockey is a blast. Many of the sports that kids can pick from are great, and I hope they play them all. 
but I also hope that they come back to this sport because of what's so special about this sport in bigger numbers than we can currently imagine. Next, please, and let me know if I'm out of time. Am I, I always go way over, so just cut me off. Okay, I'll, I'll go really fast. So the next steps, um, we're getting support now from all of the NGBs. Again, very cool for ultimate. We're in the middle of this. We're actually helping lead this as part of the group. So the sport, just in terms of how it's perceived in the Olympic family, went from we weren't in the family, now we're other people are using us as models. Um, uh, Mike and I are going to be attending a big workshop in August where all of these things I just outlined actually really start getting pushed out to the public. Um, and you'll see some announcements about that. And then we got to continue to support research and awareness. And I think I, there's one more. And just like uh, Danny described, there's a lot of other NGBs that are doing very similar work. And we're all going to plug in together and um, work on this together and develop together. I really encourage you for the sport of ultimate to go to Mike's session because he has a poster that is going to outline for you all of the work that Danny outlined for Canada and, and the initial steps we're going to take in the United States in terms of the skills and the stages and all of the things we want coaches delivering at certain times. And then I just want to finish with this. Everybody do this for me, please. <laughs> this is how complicated this is. And I mean that sort of sarcastically. But everybody at the Olympic Committee knows what I'm about to do because I did this for 10 years and I made everybody do it. Every single member of the board, everybody on the executive staff had to do this. So here's sport. And this is how simple this is. These are the athletes. These are the coaches, right? And sport gets delivered through coaches. So all we have to do in sport and in ultimate is to make sure that this kid, this is the athlete, has a coach that knows and is able to do enough to get this kid to this level. Where there's another coach, everybody doing this with me? Another coach that knows and is able to do enough to help that athlete get to this level. Where there's another coach that knows and is able to do a little bit more so that they can get that athlete to the Olympic team. Where there's a phenomenal coach like a Maddie or others that knows and is able to do what it takes to help that athlete truly maximize their potential. That's all we got to do. That's it. Right? We don't have that yet in Ultimate because we haven't focused on this very much. We're just now starting to focus on this with the young kids. Imagine when we get all of this put together and we're on the Olympic program, how exciting this is going to be. And here's a quick little thing that I probably should not say on camera, but I have to, I suppose, because that's on. We just, this is the exciting stuff. We just had a series of meetings in a board meeting in Colorado Springs, where we moved, by the way. We moved to Colorado Springs. I don't know if you noticed that. Very strategic move. Highly encouraged by the United States Olympic Committee. One of the reasons we're there. And we just had a series of meetings where the sport of ultimate could get on the Olympic program way earlier than any of us dreamed. And there's two reasons for that. One is, the IOC just finished this big, what they call 2020 reform movement. And the IOC, if you go look at it, the IOC 2020 reforms are really cool. They say the Olympic program is going to change. It's no longer going to be limited by sport like it used to be, which was going to be our biggest impediment. Now it's going to be by discipline. So they're going to open up the Olympic program to new sports by eliminating some of the disciplines that other sports currently have that nobody plays. Right? And they're going to open it up to sports that are appealing to younger generations. Think about that for a second. That are kind of hip and cool, like they've done in the Winter Games. If you think about what they've done in the Winter Games, right? You think of the last Winter Games, they got all these new ski events where you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? But the young kids know where that came from because they think it's hip and cool. I don't know if you know a summer sport like that. They're looking for sports that are very inexpensive to add to the Olympic program. Can you use venues that already exist? 
Mm -hmm. How expensive is the sport in terms of, uh, yeah, it's not expensive at all. Is it entertaining? Can it be on TV? It's already on ESPN. Really? Yeah, here's clips you can watch. Not only is it on ESPN, it's on the Sports Center top 10 all the time. Wow. So it's highly entertaining, unbelievably important to the IOC. It's got to be able to be on TV. And one of the new reforms that just came out, mixed gender, is a huge, huge thing for the IOC. They want to add mixed gender sports to the Olympic program. You know a sport that has mixed gender? <laughs> right now at the highest level of the sport? Where, at the World Games, we're the most popular sport, the most watched sport and attended sport, and the IOC knows it. So you add all of these things together, and guess what? They're really interested in the sport of ultimate, as they should be. So stay tuned for some really cool developments, and remember the simplest thing of all that in the work that you do, we just got to get to the finger model. That's all. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I'm guessing we. I'm guessing we. We have two questions. Two only, and then we have lunch, and then we. Yeah. Start Sorry if I went over, Valeria. I apologize. Yeah. I just want to say I, I really hope we can avoid the mandatory timeouts while they're playing the game. Okay, so like you watch a college football game, and every 15 minutes they'll go huddle up on the sideline and wait for five minutes and then run back in the play, and then run back 15 minutes later. I, I hate to see that come uh, to uh, Yeah, I mean, it's, everything is a compromise, right? Yeah. To be on, to be, I mean, TV, what the TV business model is, the only thing that pays for TV is advertising. And so they have to have ads to pay, and, and their production costs are incredibly expensive. So it's just, it's just a fact of the matter that, you know, if you want to be on TV, there's some compromises that you end up making. You, we try to avoid as many as you can, but no doubt. One more question, I think. Um, speaking to the fundamental of universal access, if you can give us some bullet points, like right now, how to make the sport more accessible to girls and um, mix gender and race across the sport, yeah. what would you tell us? Well, one of the things that I'm most excited about is this Olympic family membership has exposed us to those youth serving agencies that I described. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Right now, uh, in New York, um, the CYO, which is, is the sports group that I grew up in. Back, I was, I'm an East Coast guy. We all played CYO. And it was really well organized, and it was really well done. Um, right now, in New York, the CYO is going to introduce ultimate to, what did we find out, Mike? 11,000 kids is what what's his name said. That's how many they have. And he wants to have ultimate follow their basketball leagues. So after you finish playing hoops, the next thing the CYO offers you is ultimate. CYO in New York City is every kind of kid you can imagine that will get exposed to ultimate. Boys and girls clubs, um, the JCCs, they all do a great job of reaching out to a very diverse group of kids, all depending on where they're located. So I think one of the great things we have going forward is that we have all those youth serving organizations putting us on the menu and then delivering those kids to us. And I think that's where that accessibility can, one of the ways that we can really drive that accessibility. The other is, and this is a really important initiative for us, please pay attention to the foundation. Because we may ask for your help, not in terms of giving it money, but helping us find people who can donate to the foundation. Because our goal, I'll give you a very, I'll give you a very practical thing. With the great work that the Bay Area Disc Group does, I didn't get to go back to the slide. We're going to build this national infrastructure of affiliates and chapters to be the delivery mechanism and entrepreneurial partners of USA Ultimate across the United States. I'm almost going to spend my full time on that right now, is building that national infrastructure. Because let's face it, right now we have kids that are learning about the sport that can't go play. That's not a good thing because right? there's nobody there delivering the sport. So we got to build this delivery model so that when kids learn about the sport and we want that accessibility, there's somebody, there's a coach there and there's an organization there to teach those kids. So we are going to build this national infrastructure and we're going to help fund that through the foundation. And that will give that accessibility that we're talking about. 
where kids can learn about the sport and regardless of their economic, economic circumstances, every kid gets a shot at playing ultimate. And the cool thing is it's not expensive because it's ultimate, which is a really, one of the most, if not the most inexpensive sport that there is to learn. Discs are inexpensive and you already have a pair of sneakers, you can play. So I'd, I'm, I'm going to be around, love to answer more questions. Thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it.